Hello, welcome to episode 142 of the Cricket Her Weekly. Now, alongside many of you, we have been suffering this week because we have had to deal with the trials and tribulations of the live stream of England v West Indies. Um, and yeah, that's been not great, to be honest, in terms of the quality, but we've, we've persisted, haven't we, Sid? And we've been um, spending some of our hours at night watching the coverage of the first um, or of the first leg of the series, the, the three ODIs, um, England have clean swept that aspect um, of the tour. So they've they've won all three ODIs by quite considerable margins, actually, um, around about 150 runs every time. And yeah, it's been fairly easy pickings, I guess, for John Lewis's first series as coach. Yeah, not a bad one to have, is it? I th I think that you know. <laughs> What we're really seeing here is the weakness of the West Indies team at the moment. Um, unfortunately, they really seem to have slipped a long way backwards. And I think that overall what we're seeing is that for a long time they were able to, you know, produce a team that, you know, won a World Cup in 2016 uh, on the back of, you know, having three, like, absolutely world-class players and, you know, plenty of other players backing them up, but three really world-class ones in Hayley Matthews, and Deandra Dottin and Stephanie Teller. And now they're down to just Hayley Matthews with uh, Dottin having retired. Taylor's injured at the moment um, and we don't really know whether she's going to come back in it. She obviously, she's hoping to come back in some way, but whether she'll come back and, you know, play quite as much cricket as she had. She's, she's getting on a bit now. And West Indies are going to really Only in cricketing struggle. terms. <laughs> well, yes, <laughs> I can talk. Um, but West Indies are going to really struggle. You can't, you can't, play at, at that kind of level to compete with the likes of England and Australia with only one really good play. You know, we've seen that with Sri Lanka over the last few years where Atapatu has been, you know, Atapatu is obviously a world-class player and is able to ensure that they're not totally embarrassed, but she alone can't make them compete with, you know, the likes of the top teams. And, you know, so I think it's it's been a very tough a uh, few days for the West Indies, certainly, and a, a real wake-up call for them. But I really don't see what they do about it. It's they're in a very, very tough position. As for England, what do they take away from it? Well, um, you know, they've been bowled out a couple of times. Yeah. That's that's not great, especially as we're sitting here saying that you know this West Indies team are not a strong West Indies team. Um, but on the other hand, they've been bowled out while still making you know quite a pile of runs. They made over 300 in the first, didn't get bowled out. But they got bowled out, making sort of 250 scores, um, and. You know, so I guess that if you're going to make those those bigger scores, and that's that's a positive. So they've been playing, you know, the the positive brand of cricket they keep talking about. Cliche. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's one that they keep using. He Heather Knight used the word, you know, brand in her press conference, um, and. So I think that, you know, that's good, but we still, you know, we still have lost too many wickets. And what was, you know, kept us in the game is the fact that the West Indies have batted so poorly and that, you know, they just haven't got anywhere near England on, on any occasion. Um, again, so what, what we're really seeing is that England, we, we all knew this, England are walking all over the, the, quite of the, the lower tier sides, but it still remains a huge question of whether, you know, this England team is at any point going to be able to compete with the likes of Australia and it's got harder this week hasn't it because we've had a couple of injuries come through. Yeah we've had news of well I mean everyone saw the very unfortunate thing that happened to Alice Capsey in the first ODI um, diving in the field um, and somehow managed to do herself a quite a serious nasty injury and one of the most painful because it was a kind of collarbone shoulder injury. Um, she's tweeted um, a couple of days ago saying that she's had she's, she's obviously gone straight back home after that and had surgery in England um, and is now kind of going to be um, well <laughs> I don't know that she's going to be doing anything very much for the next few weeks other than recovering um, they've reconstructed her shoulder and they've obviously put pins in because she said that she's going to be setting off airport security machines um, for the, for the, rest, of for the rest of her life um, so yeah that's that's what they've done so it's obviously been quite a serious surgery um, so you know the ECB haven't made any pronouncements yet but it looks unlikely unfortunately that she's going to be back in time for the World Cup um, in February which is a, a real blow for England and a real blow for John Lewis to be honest because they obviously wanted her to play a very big role in that team and actually it was quite interesting to see that she was um, set to, to open in that first ODI and, di and indeed did open in that first ODI and I think that um, I was a bit surprised by that I mean we've been you know two of the biggest advocates for Alice Capsey I'm not sure that I would have her opening my batting lineup, but 
that that question has now become moot because she is um, sadly recovering from this injury for the foreseeable. Um, and the other piece of injury news that we've had more recently come in is that Freya Kemp um, has pulled up uh, between games and actually um, has been sent home to, um, well, it sounds like she's going to be having scans um, because they're concerned about her back. And obviously for a fast bowler, um, that's something that you do need to be watching and monitoring very carefully. So that, that sounds a bit worrying, doesn't it, Sid? It certainly does. I mean, you know, everyone's thinking it's it's another stress fracture. Obviously, the scans still need to, to confirm this. But, you know, it's something that we see so often in fast bowlers, not just in this country, but, you know, in in other places as well, particularly Australia, have had piles of problems. And we've often put them, you know, down to, in Australia in particular, down to them pushing young bowlers too, too far, too fast, too young. Um, and, you know, England in... in in the past few years were really careful with Lauren Bell in particular um, obviously a player that we know quite well and they were really careful to ensure that her workload ramped up only slowly and they didn't you know push her into the England side too quickly because they were worried about long-term injury consequences um, if you know she did too much of a, of a workload and they were really really paranoid about her workload they'd get really upset if she bowled too many overs in the nets and that kind of thing you know five years ago and they waited a long time whereas for our camp they've just gone chuck her straight in and this is what's happened Unfortunately, this is exactly what happens to the fast bowlers in Australia. They chuck them in too young and they wind up with stress fractures and then it's, it's very difficult. So, you know, I mean, obviously we want to see these players play, but, you know, I think that overall what England did with Lauren Bell, where they kept her back and back and back, is actually going to hopefully give Lauren Bell, fingers crossed, a much longer and more injury-free career, you know, when, than we're already seeing for our camp at age 17 having to, you know, have scans for a suspected stress factor. So that's very unfortunate. And obviously, Capsi, you know, we're all massively disappointed. We talked about the Capsi conundrum last week last weekend and we say now where are they going to fit her in there was a very definitive answer for that as you say from from John Lewis going right this is my definitive answer she's going to go in the top yeah. but that you only get one game and it's just one of those freak injuries it didn't even look all that when she went she just turned over in the field and it's like she you know she 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 rolled over and you, you know you expect you expected her to just get up and hurl the ball in and then you know she was obviously down for a while um and you know the, they basically had to sort of carry her off, and um, now the the normal recovery time for for that kind of injury, if it doesn't require surgery, is up to two months. Given that this has required surgery, it feels really unlikely that the World Cup is is going to happen. Yeah. So. I mean, I think um, overall for England um, from this series, you know, there have been um, a few bright spots. And I guess like the return of Nat Siva um, and what a return it's been. She's been brilliant with the bat and just kind of back to her best and, and doing what she does best. I, I did construct an England women bingo card um, slash drinking game. And, and one of the one of the items on it was Siva to the rescue. Um, so I think that's kind of positive for England. On the other hand, you kind of look at it and go, well, are they a bit too reliant on her to, to bail them out? sometimes in, in times of difficulty um, I guess Amy Jones making some runs she's had a couple of good innings in this three match ODI series and that's been really positive and um, because she's somebody who um, we've kind of talked about her struggles with the bat I think several times on the vodcast and she's obviously kind of in the team because she's the very much the first choice wicketkeeper um, but yeah so seeing her making runs has, has been nice um, but it has I think been, but the, the, the difficulty always with Amy Jones isn't it is it's like when nobody's watching then that's when she comes good and scores runs. And it's, you know, she really is someone that seems badly impacted by pressure. Mm -hmm. Over there, there's no pressure. They're playing they're playing in a big stadium, but it's virtually empty. We know a couple of people that are out there and they were like, oh, there were like 20 or 30 people in the stadium, literally. Um, so there's hardly anybody there. And it's like, you know, it's like playing a training game. And so it, it's sort of, it's a little bit like, well, surprise, surprise. <laughs> Amy, nobody's watching. But if Amy Jones scores runs and nobody's watching, has she really scored them, Raf? Yes, there's a philosophical conundrum for our, for our we'll viewers, leave that one for the viewers, viewers and listeners. Over, uh, you know, as they're lying awake at night. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I guess um, up to now for Coach John Lewis, you could say that um, in some ways this has been, as, as I've said, kind of easy pickings for his first coach of series. England have done exactly what we expected them to do. Um, and I'm not really convinced that it would have been any different under any other coach. Um, so you, you'd have to say that his kind of biggest test is very much ahead of him. Um, it was interesting because 
Um, I was actually on BBC Radio London yesterday on Ebony Rain for Brent's Women's Sports Show. Um, if you're in the UK, then you should be able to watch that. If you're not in the UK, then I think you can only uh, listen to it, rather. You can only listen to it if you're not in the UK, if you have a subscription um, to the BBC. Um, but anyway, I was on that yesterday, lunchtime, and um, they had they'd done an interview with John Lewis. Um, so I heard a little bit of that, and he was actually talking about during the T20 series um, that he had... Um, it sounded like he had some very potentially quite radical changes that he wanted to make. Um, so we'd previously talked about him as looking like he was going to be a bit of a continuity candidate, but it's going to be really interesting to see what he does in the T20s um, and you know the extent to which um, actually he does does shake things up potentially, um, you know rejig things um who does he think is going to be his his starting 11 in the world cup ultimately um and especially i guess now that that isn't going to include capsi we think and potentially isn't going to include freya kemp either um there is a certain irony in both of those players getting injured in that actually um they both of them were eligible for selection for england's under 19 world cup team um, and the ECB chose not to select them um, and we suspect that one of the reasons was a concern about workload um, and about the potential for playing in that under-19 World Cup and then not being fit to play in the main World Cup and as it stands potentially both of them may end up missing both um, but we have we are gradually getting the other country squads announced for that World Cup and in particular this week we had India's under-19 World, squad, World Cup squad has been announced um, and they have included Included um, Risha Ghosh and Shafali Verma in that um, in that squad, and it's generated quite a lot of debate on social media. I have to say, because there are people who are saying, "Hang on a minute, should you really be playing?" Kind of um, well, in particular, Shafali Verma, somebody who is practically an automatic selection now for your starting eleven in main international cricket in the un in the, in the under nineteen World Cup. A lot of other countries seem to be viewing it more as a development competition and certainly that's the way that the ECB are viewing it is it's an opportunity for younger players to break through. So what do you make of that, Sid? Well, first of all, I, I, I want to stress that the, the BCCI have done nothing wrong here. Mm. Um, you know, they've, they've made, made a decision that they, that they can make and England could have made a similar decision. I think England also made the right decision in not playing um, Capsi and Kemp in the under-19s. Um, I think that, you know, the risk of them getting injured in that, I mean, obviously, as we said, is moot, but now, but the risk of them getting injured in the under-19 World Cup and then not being able to play in the main World Cup was too great, I wouldn't have done it. And India are running this risk, right? You know, they're running the risk of Shafali getting injured in the field, just like Alice Capsi did, um, and not being able to play in the main World Cup over a, a tournament that, in terms of, like, the actual final result, honestly feels pretty meaningless. I think it's a massively meaningful tournament for the players involved, and it's a massively meaningful tournament for the entire game, given how it's a, such a big tournament involving so many countries, and, you know, getting these young players together and all put them in you know in that kind of cauldron and getting them to play against each other that's, that's all fantastic things but ultimately the result doesn't matter for me I don't think so uh, so the, the BCCI they've made a decision and it's fine the problem for me is that the the ICC should have made a rule um, they should have said you know if you've already won a full international cap then you shouldn't be able to play in the under 19 world cup now <coughs> excuse me I said this on Twitter um, some months ago, um, possibly even like a year ago, and I got quite a lot of comeback from there, saying that that was well, that was unfair on the likes of Ireland, who obviously are going to have like I think four or five players from their main, you know, first eleven are going to be playing in this Under-19 uh, World Cup because they're they're young enough, and otherwise Ireland are going to struggle to put out a competitive side. Um, and it's you know they go well, it's unfair on those people, but on the other hand, is it fair on those young Irish players that they're going to be going out and bowling to to Shafali? And you know, honestly, what what's likely to happen? here I mean you know who knows we'll see what happens but you know my guess is that we're going to see games where you know Shafali hits you know 180 runs in the 20 overs India and end up you know 320 for one at the end of it um, and you know it just produces a completely meaningless game and I suspect that what we're going to end up seeing you know is that um, she is going to really dominate the tournament and make a lot of the matches a little bit a little bit meaningless. But, you know, let's see what happens. I, I could be proved wrong. Yeah, I mean, I think the ICC in not making rules about this were to some extent relying on kind of something of a gentleman's agreement. And I say gentleman's agreement very deliberately because it's the ICC, so it's men making the rules here. Um, what they were relying on is a kind of gentleman's agreement whereby the boards um, for the leading nations um, actually kind of 
informally said, OK, well, we won't play our best players. We understand that we want it to be a genuinely competitive tournament um, and we want it to develop the next generation. Um, and so we know there's going to be 16 countries in it. Um, so we're not going to put out a full, you know, any of our full strength players, even if they are eligible. Now, it looks like the ECB um, and other boards have kind of you know, gone along with that. The BCCI have not, because you cannot rely on gentlemen's agreements at that in you know, with with this kind of thing. I think that that's that's fairly obvious. Um, so you're right. The BCCI haven't gone against any formal rules, so there's not really anything that you can take issue with them about. Um, I think that I would disagree with a couple of things you said, though, Sid. I mean, I think I've, I'm previously on record as having said on this podcast that England should be picking um, Freya Kemp and Alice Capsi um, for the Under 19 World Cup because why not? Because it's a brilliant opportunity to warm up for the main competition um, and because you know I, I, the other thing that I disagree with that you said is that it doesn't matter who wins there was actually a really interesting piece on wisdom.com this week um, suggesting that one of the reasons why India are um, have picked Shafali Verma is because um, it, you know it really matters to them that they win um, and um, the the author of this piece was basically saying, well, actually, um, you know, in terms of Indian women's cricket, that kind of a win, in, even in an under-19 tournament, but has the potential to um, advance women's cricket so much in India that it could be really significant. Um, so I'm not sure that I would kind of go along with your glib, oh, it doesn't really matter who wins, it's just about taking part. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really agree with that. I think that it is meaningful and that whoever wins will generate headlines. Um, so that's that's just my view on it. But yeah, overall, um, we can't really have an issue with the BCCI selecting Shafali Verma. Um, it just might mean that some of the matches are a bit more one sided than we were perhaps hoping for, I guess. Now, in other news this week, Sid, we have said goodbye to two of the greats of women's cricket, if I may say so. Um, one, from an international perspective... Mignon Dupree um, has renounced, um, has has announced, <laughs> has announced her retirement from all forms of international cricket. Um, I think previously she was said she was going to continue playing T20 internationals, but she's now said no, I'm not going to be doing that. Um, and the other retirement that we've seen, um, I think it was actually announced on the same day. Um, Vipers put out a tweet to say that Carla Rudd is retiring um, from from regional cricket basically um so and you've had a kind of to some extent a sort of long-standing connection with both those players Sid yeah um let's start with me on the um who was the the first player that I actually, ever actually interviewed in my sort of cricket writing career if you can call it that um and um you know a really a really nice person and you know quite a charming person and a very positive person um, and someone that's, that's very much feels like sort of part of the amateur era from a sort of, not from a sort of, you know, she treated the game very professionally. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But from an amateur era in terms of her sort of, in her enthusiasm, and she was very much playing for the love for the love of the game. And you definitely got the impression that, you know, if she'd never got paid, she wouldn't really have, she'd have just, she'd have carried on and done it still exactly the same thing. Um, she was always someone that worked really hard. I remember um, a, a match in the Keir Super League at, at Guildford. Um, where she was batting for quite a long time in the middle with with Tammy Beaumont, and this was um, after Mark Robinson uh, had already come into I England, and uh, Mark Robinson had really shaken up the fitness, and the, the England players' fitness had kind of stepped up a huge level in the first year that Mark Robinson had been there. So this was after that, and yet they came off the field, and, and Minx had basically run Tammy Beaumont ragged, and Tammy Tammy was afterwards. We, t we spoke to her, and she was like, "Gosh, <laughs> Minx really." <laughs> <laughs> really, it really goes. Yeah. Um, so, a, a supremely fit player, um, and one that's you know that's still got still got stuff to offer. I think that she's that she's someone that can still offer something in two twenty leagues. We saw she had a good women's big bash, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I'm guessing this won't be the, totally the last we've seen of her. Um, but you know, someone that's that's really given a lot to the game. Carla Rudd, someone that I've known for, for even longer. I've known her uh, since she started playing at Berkshire, which was about 12 years ago or something. Um, and, you know, she came to Berkshire when she was she was still at university, I think, at that point. Um, and it was just someone that, you know, another another kind of amateur that really wants to play. And she kind of kind of got pulled into this professional era, but without ever becoming a proper professional, because she got a job as a teacher, um, and she realised that, you know, that was a kind of a career that was going to persist. Cricket, in, for someone like her, was never offering the kind of money that would mean that she was 
happy about giving up her teaching job. So she carried on basically playing as an amateur. Obviously, she got paid, you know, the, the match fees and things, you know, got from the Kia Super League onwards. So she got some recompense. But again, not a player that you feel would have just carried on, uh, carried on playing regardless. And, you know, it's just, I think it's got to the point where she's got a bit older now. She's past 30, I think. It's 31 or something. She's um, probably utterly fed up of the fact that she works <laughs> really hard all week um, and then potentially gets one day off at the weekends from her teaching job and then spends that, um, you know, schlepping over to the Aegeus Bowl to play for to play for the Vipers. Um, so, yeah, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. It's about um, actually, yeah, her kind of, kind of carrying that amateur love of the game um, and, and giving giving it all that she that she had. And now she's perhaps decided that maybe she'd quite like a day to herself at the weekend. Yeah, and absolutely. And I'm sure that, you know, she's going to have a fantastic rest of her career. And, you know, as I said on Twitter, tw- the cricket's loss is the least school in Cambridge's gain. They've got a fantastic person to lead their sports programme going forwards. And I'm sure she'll do, she'll do an amazing job. And, you know, good luck, Carla. And hopefully we'll see you at a game sometime. It does feel like um, actually, as as more of these retirements gets announced, we really are seeing it's you know it's the last the last gasp of amateurism, isn't it? Um, and you know, pretty soon we'll be in a situation where we don't have any players left who remember amateurism. Um, and yeah, that's in some ways that's going to be a sad day. But it's just it's a mentality shift. Um, and it's, it's overall, it's I guess it's positive. Um, but yeah, we we wish both of those players very well. Now, finally, um, we did have a question come in um, over the last few days from Dan on Twitter um, after we talked about the rejig of the domestic schedule last week um, in England. And he said, it's good to hear there are more domestic games for the women's teams coming up. I thought it could have been an opportunity to introduce the longer Red Bull format and wondered what your thoughts were. Sid. Yeah, that's, that's, it's a really interesting question, I think. Um, I think the it has a slight bearing on what we've seen in the past week with England and the West Indies. Why is that, Sid, you ask? Well, the thing is that, that why are we doing this professionalism? We're, we're undertaking professionalism in order to compete with Australia. We're already at a point where we're more than competing you know, with most of the, the sides in the international arena. We can absolutely smash the West Indies, with, you know, with, with, yeah. as you put it the last week, with one hand tied behind our back. So what we're trying to do is create an environment where we compete with Australia. And by creating um, a domestic Red Bull competition, that would potentially give people the edge in the, in the test, which is perhaps the key to winning the Ashes. If you can win the test, suddenly winning the overall Ashes becomes that much easier. So was there a case for not expanding the RHF trophy and using that money and those match days instead to play some two-day, say, two-day declaration Red Bull cricket in the, in the domestic game? That's certainly something that, that I would have found very interesting and I think that I could be on board with that. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, I think that for a long time, the ECB's argument has been, oh, well, um, we want the the, um, the domestic players to be playing um, the same kind of formats that they're going to be playing internationally. Um, and, you know, that has generally, in the past few years, meant 50 over and 20 over domestic cricket. So that's been dominant. Um, I think that we're seeing um, a, a bit of a shift now, actually, in that it looks like the ECB are hoping that England women will be playing more tests on a more regular basis. So it's not just the Ashes. They're going to be hopefully playing playing tests against India and South Africa. Um, And I know that, um, you know, those three boards are also looking for a fourth board to try and join in with that and to try and bump (coughs) up... New Zealand. (laughs) Yeah, to try and bump up the amount of test cricket that's played and to actually mean that we have one test a year um, every summer, every Australian summer, every English summer, etc, etc. So, and that would be fantastic. So actually, that excuse about preparing for international cricket then um, becomes less potent, definitely. And the other thing of course is that now you've got now you're going to have nearly 100 professionals by February so the idea that you can now turn around and say oh well we can't fit it into the schedule because everything has to be played at the weekend no longer holds true because they're all training um, and all week and so you might as well be giving them match days and actually a lot of the or not a lot but a, a fair few of the domestic matches for next summer have been scheduled midweek on, on Wednesdays or Thursdays some of them on Fridays um, and so because we are at that point now we are at that tipping point where the players aren't doing something else in the middle of the week so they can do that so it's becoming possible it's becoming something that will prepare them more for international cricket Um, so I don't really see any argument against so over to you ECB it's in your hands let's wrap up there Sid thanks very much everyone for tuning in as ever see you in a week's time Bye. bye